Okay, I'm, I'm not used to lecturing about non-Austrians. <laughs> but Friedman's a special case. You got to pay attention to him. You got to know something about him. And I think I know enough to give a lecture. Uh, in fact, I, I, I'll start by telling you a story. You may have heard uh, that the beginning of the resurgence of Austrian economics happened in June of 1974. And that was an Austrian conference at South Royalton, Vermont, an extremely small town uh, with a boarding house. <laughs> and that's where we met. Uh, the lectures were Rothbard and Lachman and Kirzner. We had a, three other Austrians there, including Henry Hazlitt, uh, Bill Peterson. That was the other one. Can't think of the third one. I'll tell you if I, if I think of him. Uh, and one more dinner guest uh, for the opening dinner, and that was Milton Friedman. And what had happened is that uh, we were not that far from Dartmouth College, and our host that was running the, the uh, seminar uh, was from Dartmouth, and he had a colleague uh, to come and stay for the dinner. And it turns out the colleague was a very good friend of Milton Friedman. And so Friedman, who, who had a summer home, in uh, Vermont, and if you're in Vermont, you, you're pretty much close to everything else that's in Vermont, okay? And so Friedman was invited to the dinner, and I think he came partly to meet his old friend uh, that was also invited, but he came and, and, and we had dinner. Uh, we had about 50 people there, that was my count, uh, and most of them had never met one another, so we were meeting each other for the first time. And at the dinner, uh, the, the economists, the, the old people <laughs> at that point, uh, stood up and said something, and used to break the ice and so on. Well, when Friedman stood up, he said, there is no Austrian economics, just good economics and bad economics, okay? And so uh, that's, that has become legion in, in, uh, in Austrian circles. Everybody knows that Friedman said that. And uh, it turns out that uh, just recently, uh, Oxford University Press has uh, created a book, about 800-page book uh, on Friedman. It's called Friedman, where did it go? Friedman, Contributions to Economics and Public Policy. And it looks like that, you know, and it, it's, it's pretty thick. Um, $185 in case any of you want one. <laughs> but in the, uh, in the last section, which is on Friedman and other economists, including, it turns out, the Austrians. Uh, I have an article I was invited to write on Friedman and the, and the Austrians. And so in, in doing that, I, I sort of got up to speed on Friedman, although I've sort of kept up with him uh, all along. Uh, now let's see where we, where we go from here. In this show that I've got on the screen, how methods shape substance. And the contrast is between the Austrian methods and the Chicago School methods, and more narrowly, just Friedman's methods. Because typically, Friedman and Chicago are synonyms. <laughs> you know, they mean about the same thing, okay? It's all about the level of aggregation. Uh, I, I picked a little sentence, short sentence, out of Axel Leyenhoff's stuff, 
And he says, your aggregation scheme is your theory. And that sort of jars you a little bit. And I, uh, I write here a paraphrase from Axel Leinhoffen. Well, I think it's actually exactly what he said, but I couldn't find it, you know. So I said, I, I'll, I'll claim I paraphrased it in case I got it slightly wrong, but that's the essence of it. Uh, the aggregation scheme is your theory. And what that means is that once you decide which aggregates you're going to look at and how they fit together, then, then all you're looking for is the, re is the relationship between the aggregates. And, and you're taking it for granted that whatever is going on within the aggregates is not going to be a part of your theory. They're all concealed in the aggregate. All right? And of course, that's one of the huge differences between the Chicago school and the Austrian school. That the Austrians want to look inside the aggregate and see about stages of production and things like that. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll go along with Axel Leinhofen uh, with that statement. Uh, and now you saw that the the first screen said that we're talking about Friedman and Hayek. Well, that's right. Second screen, I've got Keynes in there. Well, you can't keep him out. You know, if, you, if you're going to compare two economists, you end up comparing each one with Keynes. <laughs> That's the way it works. <clears throat> and I'm looking at the aggregation implicit in, in, in the summary of the schools. So let's look at, uh, at Keynes. He says, theorizing at a high level of aggregation, and boy, that's true. Keynes believed that market... Economies perform perversely, especially the market mechanisms that bring saving and investment into balance with one another. Seeing unemployment and resource idleness as the norm, he's looking out his window in, in Cambridge, uh, Keynes called for countercyclical fiscal and monetary policies and ultimately for a comprehensive socialization of investment. That's in quotes. That's in the Swan Song chapter at the end of the general theory. Some of my economist friends write papers on uh, explaining just what he meant by comprehensive socialization of investment. I think that'd be a short article, wouldn't you? <laughs> that he meant it. <laughs> okay, that's... Now we go to Friedman. And, and here's something to think about. Milton Friedman's monetarism was based on a still higher level of aggregation. The equation of exchange, MV equal PQ. You know what that means. If you don't, well, uh, M is just the money, the money stock. How much money is there anyway in U.S. dollars, I suppose? Uh, v is, they call it velocity of money. That's the wrong Newtonian metaphor. Uh, velocity implies not just uh, speed, but also a direction. So, you know, which is it going north or south, you know. It, but anyhow, economists call it velocity. Uh, equals uh, the price level, okay, P, times output, which is Q. And I'm not sure why Q is output, but I think O might look like a zero. <laughs> So they put a little tag on it. It's Q. So uh, that's that's total consumable output. It's it's final output. All right. And uh, if you look at that, if you tear it, stare at that very long, you know that it really is just a truism that MV is the amount of money people spend. Okay. And PQ uh, is the same thing as what they spend on. The, on the output, okay? So uh, it's, it's pretty much an identity. Uh, so he made use of the all-inclusive output variable Q, putting into eclipse the issue of the allocation of resources between current consumption and investment for the future. So here we'd have to go with Keynes on that. So at least he makes this distinction between uh, consumption and investment. So seeing no problems emerging from the market itself, Friedman focused on the relationship between the government-controlled money supply 
in the overall price level. Right? So that was, that was his focus. Well, we'll go on to Hayek. Capital-based macroeconomics, that's what I call it, although it's, it's caught on, and other Austrian-oriented economists call it capital-based macro, too, is distinguished by its propitious, I like that word, propitious disaggregation, so we got it right, uh, which brings into view both the problem of intertemporal resource allocation and the potential for a market solution. Okay, So F.A. Hayek showed that coordination of saving and investment decisions could be achieved by market-governed movements in interest rates. He also recognized that this aspect of the market economy is especially vulnerable to the manipulation of interest rates by the central bank. And of course, when the central bank manipulates interest rates, that's when you start to get booms and busts. Okay. So he's got, I think, the right level of uh, aggregation. <clears throat> okay, so we got that straight. He's much better than Keynes. Much better, what I say. Uh, the Austrians are much better than Friedman or Keynes in that sense. Okay. Now, here's, what, here's the way Keynes goes at it. Keynes was the type of theorist who developed his theory after he had developed a sense of the relative magnitudes and the size of and frequency of changes in these magnitudes. He concentrated on those magnitudes that changed the most, uh, often assuming that others remained fixed for the relevant period. Right? Now, this, when I read this, it caused me to, to suggest a new economics tool for the economist tool chest. And that tool is called a variation sieve, all right? So the idea is there, what, what Keynes is doing is before he even tries to figure out what's going on in the world, he looks at all the, the different possible variables and you pour them through the sieve and the ones that hang up in the sieve those are your building blocks for your theory. And you know, it's going to be consumption and investment, <laughs> income, you know, the biggies. They vary a lot, in, especially in a business cycle. You know. And other things that just seem not to vary much fall through the sieve. Well, one of the first things that falls through the sieve is the interest rate. Okay? Especially in... Uh, a business cycle situation because what typically happens, uh, and it did happen in the 20s, and where it crashed in 29, is that there really was something of a real boom in the economy of all sorts of technological innovations in automobiles, in plastics, uh, in nylons, and you know, on and on, refrigerators, and so on. There was a, a, a boom afoot, all right? Uh, and in order to take advantage of, of the technology, uh, lots of investors wanted to borrow lots of money and make all these things happen. Okay, well, that puts upward pressure on the interest rate, doesn't it? But the central bank uh, had a policy of holding the line on interest rates. So... They didn't let the interest rates rise. And so the interest rate didn't change much, but it didn't change much at a point when it should have changed. And that's what gave us a, 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 strong, uh, a strong boom that wasn't geared to the, to the actual uh, investments. Okay, let's go on. Now look what Milton Friedman says. I believe that Keynes' theory is the right kind of theory in its simplicity, its concentration on a few variables, magnitudes, and its potential fruitfulness. Right. Now he said that for a different reason than Keynes did. I'm not sure why Keynes decided that's the way to go. But can any of you guess why Friedman said that's the right kind of theory? 
because Friedman is a econometrician. His early degree was in, was in statistics. And if you have an interest rate that's not changing, <laughs> and you stick it into your equation to see how much, it, it doesn't have an effect, okay? So anything goes through the sieve is simply not going to help you out. And so you look at all the things that hang up in the sieve, and that's that becomes your theory. And you'll make a story out of it somehow. And yet, if you stand back and look at, at, at all of the variables, including the ones that fell through the sieve, uh, what you see is that what got in the sieve uh, is typically the, the consequences. It's not the cause of anything. It's the consequences of the things that went on before the sieve. Uh, the implication is that big effects have big causes. Well, I mean, that's true in some cases. Um, Pompeii, I guess, in the volcano, pretty big cause. But it doesn't have to be a big cause, okay? And in this case, it's not. Okay, And yet Friedman sort of signed on with Keynes. We're all Keynesians now. And what he says is we all use the Keynesian language and apparatus. Well, that all is too inclusive, isn't it? He wasn't thinking about the Austrians. That was in Time Magazine in 68. Now, so you can see here both Keynes and Hayek just looking for whatever's changing the most, and then trying to correlate them and see what kind of a story you can make out of those without bothering about the interest rate. Look what Hayek says. He says, the role of the economist, Hayek points out, in the pure theory of capital in 1941, uh, is precisely to identify the features of the market process that are apt to be hidden from the untrained eye. And boy, in the 1920s, when interest rates didn't rise in circumstances where a, a good economist like Hayek would know they should have, unless somebody's got their thumb on the, on the spigot. <laughs> For Hayek then, cause and effect relationships between central bank policy during the boom and the subsequent economic downturn have a first order claim on our attention despite the more salient co-movements and macroeconomic magnitudes <clears throat> that characterize the post-crisis spiraling of the economy into deep depression. And here, let me, let me give you the terminology here. When he says post-crisis, <clears throat> what does that mean? Does that mean after the depression? No, it means after the initial downturn. In other words, the, the first thing you notice and the first thing that has to be explained is how was it the economy was going up and then it tipped over and started the other way? It's a crisis. That's a crisis. Okay. And then what happened after that was a catastrophe. <laughs> the Great Depression. Uh, and, so, and so the Hayekian theory or the Austrian theory is aimed at explaining the crisis, explaining the downturn. They're not trying to explain everything that happened after the downturn. All right, and we'll see what some of those things are if you didn't already know, and maybe most of you do, okay? And so <clears throat> here's Hayek again. He says, there may well exist better scientific evidence that is empirically demonstrated regularities among key macroeconomic magnitudes, and what do you think makes them key? They flop around a lot, okay? For a false theory, which can be accepted because it's more scientific, and puts that in scare quotes, not really more scientific, <clears throat> it's more econometric, okay, than for, those valid, than for a valid explanation, which is rejected because there's no significant quantitative evidence for it. Now, that might be too strong to say no significant quantitative evidence for it, but there certainly is a problem in figuring out what the rate of interest would have been, all right? And in our um, question and answer sessions 
throughout this week. There's been a number of people who ask, how do we know the interest rate is below the natural rate? What is the, what is the natural rate? And boy, you have no way of, of determining that because the, federal, the central bank has taken that away from you. They've done something that you know that they're not in the right spot, but you don't know where the right spot really is. And yet, uh, in debate, and Friedman's a great debater, <laughs> he can <clears throat> put that on him and, and stay with his uh, aggregates. Okay. So that's how methods shape substance, isn't it? I mean, if you're a dyed-in-the-wool econometrician, that's, and that's the way you go at it then uh, you're going to miss what actually caused. This is identifying the cause. And Keynes, here's Keynes again, but here I think it's just funny. He says, Keynes attributes the downturn to psychological factors affecting the investment community rather than to monetary or fiscal or interest rates or anything else, psychological factors. Well... It's not an economic um, explanation. And then he says, listen to this, I suggested a more typical and often prominent explanation of the crisis is a sudden collapse in the marginal efficiency of capital. That's just the rate of return on real capital. Uh, that's not an explanation, is it? How do you explain this? Oh, Sudden collapse, <laughs> and if you if you hang in there and say, well, what what caused the collapse? You know what the answer is, don't you? Animal spirits. <laughs> End of story. Keynes' main focus, focus, however, is on the dynamics of the subsequent downward spiral and on the policies aimed at reversing the spiral's direction. So, okay, something happened. Animal spirits, a collapse, and now here goes the economy that way. Well, we'll focus on that one, you know, and try to figure out how to stop it and turn it around. And, of course, it's fiscal policy, monetary policy. It, it's pumping in more money, uh, not realizing that, well, wait a minute, it was pumping in the money that caused the problem in the first place. And here's Friedman. Friedman, I, I, I've combed this out of the literature. Friedman is dismissive of the whole issue of the cause of the initial economic downturn. And I've picked the, the words he used out of a number of articles. He refers to it, <coughs> excuse me, he refers to it as unusual, ordinary, routine, normal, run-of-the-mill, and garden-variety recession. So... <laughs> When he said, even, even in, for the Great Depression, uh, he says, okay, so it started out with a garden variety recession. A garden variety, what does that mean? <laughs> it's a garden variety recession. And then in parentheses, says, although it was a pretty big one, <laughs> even the crisis was a big one, and then it starts down. But... Uh, and, and so what you have to realize, and, and I haven't, I don't know many economists who have realized it and got, got it stuck in their heads, is that the monetarists and the Austrians are talking about two different phases. The Austrians are talking about why it turned down. And the monetarists are thinking about why it went so low after that. Okay. Uh, and and the reason they are, I think, is because they can use econometrics to do it. They can't. They don't have the econometrics to say uh, why it turned down. For Friedman, correlation between the subsequent movements in the money supply and the movements in total output leaves no doubt as to the central issue. That's. I mean, that just sounds like if you've heard Friedman or read Friedman, that's the kind of thing he says. Has no doubt. No doubt as to the central uh, issue. Hayek focuses on the policy infected aspects of the boom. That is, the artificially low interest rate. 
even though it didn't change, it's still artificially low because it should have changed and the implication for the boom sustainability, okay? The post-bus reallocation of labor and capital, labor and capital takes time, but the actual dimensions of the recession, its length and depth, are to be explained largely in terms of the perverse policies that hamper the recovery. That's not, uh, that, that's my wording, but that's what Hayek uh, is talking about. And if, and if you think about uh, all of the things that are perverse wording, uh, that's starting with Hoover and then Roosevelt, and here we have good history complementing our good economics. When Rothbard talks about the Depression, he blames as much of it on Hoover as he does on Roosevelt. Okay, And so what was going on there? Hoover had a high wage policy. Uh, Hoover was involved in the passage of the Smoot-Hawley tariff. Uh, and for Roosevelt, you have the cartelis cartelization of industry. You had crop destruction programs. Now, we don't do that anymore. We don't destroy crops, okay? Uh, even Obama wouldn't destroy, destroy crops. And why is that? Because he can crush cars instead, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's just, <laughs> the same effect. It's an increase in technology. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Blue Eagle price fixing. Uh, you know, prices were high. Uh, and uh, an undistributed profit tax, which is just deadly. Think about what that means. That if you earn profits, you can't use those profits to build your bu the business unless you first pay a big tax, okay? Uh, and that was, that was debilitating for a lot of people. Uh, okay, let's go on. Hayek and Friedman head-to-head, -head, how methods shape substance a summary. For Friedman, the full analysis of the business cycle consists almost wholly of the empirical accounting of the depression's depth and length. For Hayek, the, the business cycle theory is fundamentally a theory of the unsustainable boom and the subsequent reallocation of, uh, or of misallocation, misallocated resources, accounting for the actual depth and length of the depression that ensues requires an economic and historical historical account of each particular episode. So there's, there's nothing that's all that similar from one to the other. You know, somebody crack, crushes cars and somebody else plows under potatoes and so on. Now, here's a article by Evans, what's his name? Eichen Green, that's it, in Michener. You can't read that. Just tell you what the... Yeah, I guess you can. I can't read it on this little screen. So, Eichen Green's paper is excellent, so says Friedman. Friedman. It's excellent, clear, well-written, thoughtful. There's little in it that I disagree with. At the same time, I share the views expressed by the discussants, which is Michael Bordeaux and Charles Goodhart, both of whom are monetarists, that it does not contribute much to the key issue in the question. The issue is whether the depth and seriousness of the Depression is attributable to what took place during the 1920s or what took place during the 30s. Well, of course, the depth and seriousness of the Depression has to do with what went on during the 30s. But during the 20s, we got that initial crisis that to set it into motion. And yet, this is one of the things that Friedman throws up to the Austrians at every opportunity. Now, here's, he goes on, and I underlined his only. The only item that has any bearing on that is the correlation of the measures of the credit boom with the depth of the subsequent depression. Here, um, he gets a positive correlation of 0.43 for the height of that measure. The stock of 
market boom, stock market boom, okay, that is pretty low. The bulk of the evidence is that what happened in the 30s explains the 30s, not what happened in the 20s. Well, see, he, he has just so blanked out that initial crisis that his only focus was on the rest of it, right? And Hayek did just the opposite. He didn't blank out the, the whole depression, but he realized that it was due to a lot of things going on. So I think that's very telling. Okay. <laughs> I think I got the wrong, the wrong PowerPoint here. No, it's it's right. It's right. Because I'm trying. <laughs> I'm going to try to drive the point home. But now, just standing here, I think, well, wait. I've already driven it home. But, but let's do it. Let's do it anyhow. Suppose that in late October of 1929, a thousand-pound monster descends on Mississippi soil. Okay. You spend the next three and a half years eating all the cabbages and quite a few rabbits between Tupelo and Pascagoula. By early March of 1933, the monster weighed 4,000 pounds. Jesus. Okay. Two investigators are sent to Mississippi to get a handle on the situation. One's from Vienna. <laughs> the other's from Chicago. <laughs> okay. That's how, you know, I Googled Mississippi monster and that's who I got, or what I got. <laughs> I don't know. The Viennese investigator asked, where in the world did this hideous thing come from? It turns out on further in investigation that the monster, this is the Viennese, yeah. The monster was the unintended consequence of some ill-conceived government-sponsored bionics project. End of story. Okay, that's it. That's what it was. All right. The Chicagoan shows up, shoves the Austrians aside, uh, and says, never mind how this thing got here. The key question is, how did it grow from 1,000 pounds to 4,000 pounds? How did the ordinary, unusual, routine, normal, run-of-the-mill, garden variety <laughs> monster... Quadruple is right. <laughs> the Chicago's answer, of course, it was all of those cabbages. He couldn't get good data on the rabbits. <laughs> this is Chicago economics. The strong correlation between cabbage consumption and weight gain of the monster leaves no doubt as to the central issue. I mean, that was... <laughs> That's the story. Okay. So query, well, you, I don't have to query, you know. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go past that one. Now, more about Friedman's monetarism. I'm going to pick up the speed here a little bit. MV equal PQ with a nearly constant velocity of money. It, it, it droops down a little bit, but not very much, okay? Uh, output growing slowly, well, you know, maybe 3%. Uh, movements in the price level P largely reflects movements in the money supply M. So there's, we we'll call it a constant V, even though it goes down a little bit, and uh, a little bit of upward movement in Q, but a pretty substantial movement in M, especially in the uh, pre-crisis mode, right? And so that gives a big boost to P. It's not quite as big as M, but this part of it is, is Q going up. Uh, and, and then here's the final line. It has that the cause and effect is between money and prices. Well, I think that's true. Uh, and then, though, with a lag of 18 to 30 months, which seems like a long time. You know, if you pump a lot of money in the economy, why would it take a year and a half, up to two and a half, uh, in order for that to show up in, in, uh, in an inflation? Uh, and he's hard-pressed. You see, he doesn't use 
any kind of Austrian capital theory, he uses the Frank Knight capital theory. You can't do much with services and sources. So you can't, you don't get any time element there. In fact, Knight says there is no time element in capital. So it all has to be somewhere else. And so what he, what he does is put it on wage rates, okay, that workers go to work and uh, prices go up and it takes them 18 to 30 months <laughs> To realize they're not making as much now as they used to. So, so more people came into the labor force to take advantage of the boom, and yet it took them up to two and a half years to figure out uh, they're not making as much money as they did before. So really, how does it take that long for people to figure out what the real wage is? And the answer here, well, it's only because we don't have any capital theory and the only thing else you can pin it on is the labor force. Okay, it goes that way. And one thing I point to, and I think it would make a good dissertation, is that uh, even if you take his ideas seriously on that, just think that, that uh, booms and busts uh, have a shorter phase in South American countries than they do in the U.S. The U.S. is very much more capital intensive and the South American countries aren't. So you think the, the less capital intensive economy uh, would, would get that boom bust thing out of, out of the way much before an economy like the U.S. where it's, where it's a, a long uh, production process and it takes a long time to figure out that the thing is discoordinated in the middle. Okay. Inflation is always an everywhere monetary phenomenon. Well, I'll buy that for from uh, Friedman. And the monetary rule he wants is to increase the money supply at a slow and steady rate to achieve long-run price level constancy. Uh, and, he, and by a steady rate, he means decide the rate and keep it at that level, don't look at anything else. Uh, and yet, I, what, I, what I do here is suggest, see there, if you have a slow and steady rate, it matches the increase in Q, and so you end up with a constant price level. That's, that's the price level constancy that he's talking about. Okay, but it also turns out and then that doesn't show up very good uh, that it distorts the loanable funds market because because even that rate goes through the loan markets and is likely to give you a downturn even with a constant price level. Friedman declares the 20s as the golden years of the Federal Reserve. See, he's got that. That's a chapter. That's the chapter title in his big book on uh, monetary theory. Uh, he ignores interest rates during the 1920s because they didn't change much. But what if they should have changed but weren't allowed to? See, and that's where you come in with Hayek. During the 20s, breakthroughs in technology, okay, we've said that, so I'll go on. The Federal Reserve, guided by the real bills doctrine, so if people are doing something real, if they're making something, they need credit, then they get credit. Uh, and of course, more of that happened during the 20s with the uh, uh, innovations and so on. Uh, so that's, that keeps the interest rate from rising. He okay, says, so seeing no change in interest rates, Friedman dismisses interest rates as a potential independent variable in his econometric equations. Well, you'd have to, because you stick it in, it's not going to show any effect in anything. <coughs> seeing no changes of the interest rate when they should have risen because of the technological advances, Hayek was able to identify some critical market forces hidden from the untrained. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. So which which view, Freeman's or Hayek, is more firmly anchored in the empirical, that is, historical circumstances of the 1920s? I think the Austrians. This was anchored, yeah, I want to show you that. Uh, the story is that I had heard a long time ago that Friedman had his license plate in V, well, the equation of exchange, okay? And at the time, I was at Institute for Humane Studies in Menlo Park, California, which was adjacent to Stanford University, where the Hoover Institution is, and where I am, and where Friedman was. And so I got my camera and walked over, had to climb a fence or something, but I walked over and looked around. I wanted a picture of his Cadillac with MV equal PQ, okay? Now, <clears throat> I'll have to confess, it was a hot day, and, I, and it was a big lot, and I really couldn't find it. But I did find this red and white Cadillac, and so I took the picture and then did a little jiggling later. <laughs> Best I could do. Uh, I, know, I know some people, I had it on my website, so some people copied it and sent it to Milton, I think. Okay, but now look, here's, here's Greg, Greg Mankiw's blog. This seems uh, sort of beside the point, but you'll see. Yeah, there he is. So some, somehow or other, while he was on, uh, on TV, he asked something about, well, how can you identify my card? You know that. Uh, and it turns out, that's it. It's kind of limp, you know, which is, that's the course he taught. EC equals... 10, well, okay. And then some things people wrote in. Hate to spoil things, but, you know, found somebody else who said, years ago, trying to find Friedman's apartment in San Francisco, I knew I was in the right location when I spotted the license plate that read MV equals PT. T? T means transactions, and that's Irving Fisher which is all transactions, not just for consumables, but all down the line, you know. So that's, that's the Fisher equation. They can't be right, all right? Uh, so there was more. Milton Friedman's license is MV equal PQ. I nailed it, see? Not MV equal PT. And, and then he, there's a link uh, to the Internet. I don't know if we're on the Internet. We'll see. Uh, anonymous rights, that's pretty ridiculous. And then Kearney says, I love economists. <laughs> so let's see if we can get the... Well, there's France. The thing is in France, in French. Isn't that France? Okay. There it is. Come on. Okay, there on the bottom in, in purple, you have to read it in French. Oh. They stole mine. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's Friedman's. He's got him big with PY. Okay, <laughs> and why? Why is nominal income? And it's wrong that uh, if you if you know enough, if you read the monitor stuff, uh, for a real magnitude, they use lowercase letters. And this seems backwards to me. If it's real, make it capital letter, you know. But no, if it's real, it's a lowercase level. So that should be MV equal P and then a lowercase Y. And, and here, this Friedman, uh, he'll get his way. He'll talk anybody into anything. I wonder how much time he spent at DMV trying to insist on a lowercase y. <laughs> and they kept saying, we don't have any. You know? So he put the y in there. Now, it looks to me like the equal sign is made by some black tape. And I think my rendition was better. Okay. Now we'll go on. I'm going to go on just a little bit. Does Keynes recognize the significance of the loanable funds market in the context of a business cycle? No, he denies that saving depends on the interest rate, and he all but denies 
investment depends on interest rates. He jettisons the loan on the funds market. Savings depends only on income, and investment expenditures are based on predominantly on psychological considerations. Okay. Friedman doesn't get it either. No. Okay. So S equals minus A plus 1BY, there's no interest rate in there. And investment is I sub zero, no interest rate there. Okay. And for, for Friedman, it's MV equals PQ. Okay. And here, he doesn't throw it away, it just gets subsumed there in Q. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is Friedman's plucking model, so-called. I, I, I wrote a comment and got some uh, letters back and forth from Friedman, but he actually draws, he didn't draw it, he just explains it, and I drew it, that this is, this is the path that you have when you have uh, business cycles. But he misidentified things. He, he's got a bust, and then the recovery from the bust he calls a boom. And, and then he says that we really don't have a boom-bust cycle, we have a bust-boom cycle. See, because, because the bust is first, and then you get a boom to go back. So, <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> The empirical evidence then shows that we simply don't have a boom-bust sequence to theorize about. We have a bust-boom. It's hard to say. Friedman takes this empirical study, which initially was published in the annual report of the National Bureau, as being utterly inconsistent with the von Mises theory. He goes on so far as to say that this one little bit of evidence is decisive refutations against Mises. Have the von Misesians in any way stopped saying exactly what they were saying for 50 years? Not a word of it. They keep on repeating the same nonsense. Okay. And he's kind of adamant there, yeah. Okay. That was an interview. And there you are. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>